Hi, I'm Drew Hoffman from UC Davis Sociology. Today I'm going to address the question, how do the American and Swedish welfare states differ? Let's start with the US. So first I'm just gonna sort of talk about the different programs and I'll draw some of the contrasts. We'll start with the US. Um, the US has a two-tier pension system. Uh, the first tier is Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance, OASDI, what's commonly referred to as Social Security. Um, this provides benefits to old people uh, at a replacement rate of approximately 40% for an average wage earner. The second program is Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. This is a program that's less generous than, than OASDI. Uh, it's for people who did not work enough during their lifetimes to qualify for Social Security. Um, these benefits can be up to $698 a month, uh, depending on the size of the family. So this is a, a, a lower, less generous tier to the pension system. There's also disability insurance, um, either through OASDI or through SSI. And this relates very much to, you know, did the person work or not? If you work and then become disabled, you would be eligible for Social Security at quite a generous pension. If you never work, in other words, were maybe disabled from birth and were unable to work, you most likely would receive payments from SSI, much less generous. So this is very interesting sort of inequality among people with disabilities, depending upon whether they worked first before they uh, in encountered their disability. The United States also has an unemployment insurance program. It has work and workers' compensation, which compensates people for uh, uh, provides um, health insurance for when people get injured on the job. There's a refundable child tax credit of $500. Uh, refundable means that people may owe $1,000 in taxes and they get this child tax credit, it reduces their tax liability to $500. But what if I didn't owe anything in taxes, if I had no tax liability? Well, because it's refundable, I would be eligible for a check from the government for $500. So that makes the tax credit serve not just more middle class people who have a tax liability, but also poor people who do not have a tax liability. The United States also has a requirement for large corporations that parents be given, uh, like new parents for example, be able to take a parental leave of 12 weeks. There are a number of programs meant to address poor people in the United States, and this is something unique to the United States is that a lot of its programs are focused on the poor rather than on the broad middle class. The United States has something called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a tax credit for the working poor. This is also refundable in the way I just mentioned. It has TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Program. Uh, this is aid to poor people uh, with a work and education requirement, uh, poor people with children, I should say. Uh, there's general assistance for the childless poor who are not eligible for SSI. This is quite small, usually $100 to $400 per month. Only 30 states have it, and only 12 of those states covered people, cover people who do not have a disability. So this is mainly a program for people with disabilities in only some states. There's also the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, SNAP, used to be called Food Stamps. Um, there's also Head Start, which is a child care program for the poor. It's very popular among both Republicans and Democrats, but it's never been funded properly. And as a result, only about 20% of the people who are eligible for the program are actually able to take advantage of it. Lastly, there's the healthcare system in the United States, which is a very uh, ornate, complicated, hybrid system with lots of different components. First of all, it has public health insurance for the old, which is called Medicare. There's also public health insurance for the poor, which is called Medicaid. Um, some states like to call it by their own term, and in California it's called Medi-Cal. Um, there's also a public health service, and when I say health service, that means that the government doesn't just pay for the health care, but they actually provide the health care in their own hospitals with their own doctors. So there's a public health service for veterans in the United States called the Veterans Administration. Most people get their insurance from their employer. Uh, and this employer-provided insurance is subsidized by a tax exclusion where uh, the benefits provided by an employer for health insurance are not taxed. They're provided tax-free to the employees. Uh, recently, the Affordable Care Act passed, well, I guess not that recent, 2008, the Affordable Care Act passed, uh, often referred to as Obamacare. 
This provides subsidies to people to purchase private insurance um, if they are not covered by their employer. And then lastly, uh, the United States does not have a nursing home insurance program, but many people receive nursing home care through the Medicaid program, the program for the poor. Um, basically, Medicare does not really cover um, long-term care, and so people will enter a nursing home, uh, Medicare will make a few payments and then stop, and then basically they have to spend all of their money until they become poor, then they will be eligible for Medicaid. So it's odd, you know, Medicaid is mainly a poor people's program, but many of the people on the program are elderly people in nursing homes who were formerly middle class, but who became poor so that they could, well, became poor because they had nursing home expenditures, and now they're eligible for Medicaid. Let's talk about Sweden. Oh, before we do that, uh, the number of people lifted out of poverty by these various programs um, might surprise you. Most people think of poor people's programs, when they think about those programs, they think about the means-tested programs. In other words, the programs that are directed only for the poor, that are targeted to the poor. But it's actually not those programs that do the most to raise the poor out of poverty. And so universal programs that serve both poor people and non-poor people uh, raise many, many people out of poverty. The biggest of these is Social Security. Raises 22 million people out of poverty in the United States has done tremendous, a tremendous amount to reduce poverty among the elderly in the United States. There's also the child tax credit, which is available to everyone, poor or non-poor, but which disproportionately helps people who are poor, uh, and it raises two million of them out of poverty. Unemployment insurance, also for the poor and non-poor, raising 1.2 million people out of poverty. Then there are the means-tested programs. The largest of these is the earned income tax credit, which raises a little more than five million people out of poverty. There's housing assistance for the poor, which raises four million out of poverty. Food stamps, which raise four million out of poverty. The supplemental, uh, supplemental security income, which raises almost four million out of, people out of poverty. And then lastly, TANF, temporary assistance to needy families, which is, raises 1.4 million out of poverty. Most people, when they think of a poverty program, they think of TANF. Uh, it's the main program tar targeted to poor people with children, mainly women. But that's really um, a misapprehension about the ways in which the American welfare state serves the poor. We'll talk about a lot of programs, some oriented to the poor, some not, but they all uh, have major benefits for the poor. Let's talk about Sweden. Sweden also has a two-tier pension system. Uh, it's a little different than the United States' two-tier system in that the tiers are both higher than the American tiers. First of all, they have a universal pension. Everyone receives it regardless of whether they worked during their lifetimes or not, uh, and it's paid in the same amount to everyone. Uh, in the American system, people receive payments based on how much they earned when they were working. In the Swedish system, everyone's receiving the exact same amount. Universal is a term meaning you know, the same or equal across everyone, everyone getting it. Uh, a second pension system is the income-based system, which is closer to our Social Security system. It's based on how much people earned while they were in the workforce. Uh, this pension was basically established because many of the more upper-income people in Sweden were not happy receiving the universal pension, which did not provide as high a standard of living as they had had when they were working, and so they wanted to have an income-based pension as well. Um, so that that adds some inequality into the Swedish system that is somewhat different than the, the general orientation of the system. Sweden has a universal, universal national health service, uh, meaning that uh, health services are provided by the government. The government owns the hospitals. The government um, employs the doctors. This national health service also includes home health care and nursing home care, so it's quite comprehensive. There's also sickness insurance. Um, this is basically sick days. In the United States, um, your employer may give you sick days if you have a good job. If you have a crappy job, your employer may not pay for your sick days. And sometimes you can even get fired if you take sick days. In Sweden, there's a mandatory number of days that you can take, and the government pays for those days uh, that you take. It's, it's not up to the employer. Uh, there's also a family allowance in Sweden of about $1,800 a year. Uh, this, in this way, the society helps pay for um, raising children. Uh, this is somewhat similar to our child care tax credit of $500, though obviously larger. 
These are the ones that really surprise people. Uh, paid parental leave of one year and three months at an 80% replacement rate. Uh, we'll talk about replacement rates a lot in this course. Um, the replacement rate is the percentage of your normal income that is provided by a particular program. So for example, if you made uh, you know, $10,000 a month uh, and uh, while you were working and then you retired, you would receive $8,000 a month if there was an 80% replacement rate. So you're getting about 80% of your normal wage. So in this parental leave program, people are receiving a very high level of benefits um, that compensate for most of the time that they're out of the workforce. And it's long too, one year and three months. There's also, um, people can take a paid leave to take care of a sick child or an elderly parent of up to two months. There are paid contact days, uh, 10 days for you to um, attend a school conference uh, of your child or something of that sort. Uh, universal preschool for ages one to six. So basically the system, the way the system works is that um, people have a child, they leave the labor force for uh, a year and three months, and then the child enters uh, universal uh, low cost daycare. There are also after school and school holiday, holiday child care centers. Uh, there's quite extensive assistance and public housing for the poor, very generous unemployment insurance, and I'll say a little bit about more about that in a minute. And then lastly, something called active labor market policy, which is something uh, unique to Sweden and, and uh, a real claim to fame for Sweden, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second as well. Let's compare unemployment insurance in the United States and Sweden. Uh, in Sweden, the limit for receiving unemployment insurance is 300 days. The replacement rate is 80%, quite high. The coverage rate is 90%. Most unemployed people are covered by the system. In the US, the limit is 182 days, so shorter. The replacement rate is about 50%, so less generous. Uh, moreover, the number of people who are eligible is quite a bit lower. Uh, you have to have been in the labor force for at least 15 weeks during the previous year or have earned a minimum amount set by statute. Let's talk about, about active labor market policy to finish up this comparison. Uh, active labor market policy is a system of um, programs that uh, the government provides in order to make the, the labor market work better for, empl for employees and also sort of to socialize the costs of um, labor market dislocations. So there's a few dimensions here. So one is on the labor supply aspect. Uh, the government provides extensive educational retraining and vocational programs to workers, uh, provides programs that provide work experience for youth. Um, they often will um, help employers to provide training to workers who are, uh, have skills that are no longer necessary in the economy. Uh, on the labor demand side, uh, the government will provide subsidies to employees to help them hire or retain workers during slowdowns. Uh, they'll provide funding, as I said, to help uh, employers retain their obsolete, obsolete uh, workers, or obsolete skills, I should say, and encourage their retention. Uh, oftentimes, the government will just buy a bunch of stuff during a recession uh, in order to make the recession less severe. It will also provide temporary public sector relief jobs to people who are unemployed. Uh, the United States had a program similar to this during the New Deal. It was called the Works Progress Administration. Uh, Roosevelt meant for that program to stick around till today, but it was ended by the Republican Congress in 1940. Lastly, uh, there's coordination within the labor market. Uh, this is aptitude testing, employment counseling, job placement services, and even relocation grants. If uh, somebody is unable to find a job in their local area and they can find a job in another part of the country, the government will help to pay for their move to that job. The goal here is to, I mean, it's, this is capitalism, okay? And so, you know, some job, they're gonna, companies are gonna go out of business, companies are gonna shed workers because they can't afford them. Uh, worker skills are going to become obsolete, but the goal here is to socialize those costs, not to put them all on the worker. Instead, the government's saying, you know, it's good that we have labor market flexibility, but we need to um, make sure it's, that it's not just the worker who pays the costs of this flexibility. So that's all I'll say for now, but we'll talk more uh, about, um, you know, these differences between uh, the U.S. and Sweden and also between um, those countries and other, con other rich countries. One last comparison I'll make, 
this, this is a figure that shows um, the poverty rate in different countries. And the way poverty is measured here is um, they take the median income in each country and then take half of that median income and define that as the poverty line. Now in this figure there are um, the red um, lines and then the darker blue lines. Uh, the red lines show the amount of poverty before welfare state programs kick in. Uh, the blue lines show the poverty rate after the, those benefits are provided. And what you'll see here is that in most countries the sort of pre-welfare state poverty rate is quite high in the area of 20-25%. Uh, in the United States and Sweden, it's about 26% in each place. So very similar levels of market-produced poverty. But what's different is, is that Sweden does much more through its welfare state to reduce poverty, uh, reducing the poverty rate to just 5% after the welfare state programs kick in. The United States only reduces poverty to 17% through those programs. So, you know, the high levels of poverty in the United States are not because, you know, our labor market works differently or that there's less opportunity in our economy necessarily than in Sweden. It's because we do less to end poverty through various social programs. And that's a very key distinction between the United States and Sweden and between the United States and other rich countries more generally.